Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have with us today a wonderful group of industry stakeholders who are approaching film from different angles as filmmakers, producers, festival programmers, um, community organizers as well. Um, and here we are one year after the original COVID lockdown facing an industry that has experienced um, a racial reckoning, uh, a belated realization of the level of systemic oppression that exists within our work and dictates which films get to get made and who is qualified to make them. Um, so we're going to use this time to imagine a different kind of film industry um, and try to talk through what that feels like, one where we're valued and heard and not judged or second guessed. And I'm excited to be able to hear from our panelists and for others to learn from, from our experiences. Um, and I'm hoping that this conversation will be a way to move forward towards um, identifying a, a code of ethics, if you will, or best practices for film organizations and festivals who want to do better by their BIPOC queer staff. Um, so, of course, um, in order to come up with these ideas, we have to talk through also what not to do as well. So we'll be getting into that too. Um, all of our speakers here, I wanna thank you in advance for your frankness and your transparency, as that's the only way we're going to be able to create change. So let's start by introducing ourselves and how we identify. Um, I'm Lucy Mukherjee, I'm a film curator and inclusion activist. Um, I'm also a queer biracial female and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, Campbell, over to you. I am Campbell X. I am a filmmaker. I made the feature film Stud Life and also uh, I made two short documentaries, Visible and uh, Desire. And I directed two web series, uh, Different for Girls and uh, Spectrum London. Um, and for those who might not be able to see, I'm going to describe myself. Um, I am wearing a denim -y sort of cap and a denim jacket. <laughs> wearing a lot of clothes, actually. <laughs> And a check shirt and I've got um, a septum ring and um, sort of glasses and I'm a black guy and my pronouns are he him. Bianca you're at the top of my screen now so over to you. Hi good morning over here in LA I am Bianca Quesada my pronouns are she and her and I am the head of development and production at Stone One Productions, a newly founded company uh, founded by myself and my partner, Moises Zamora, with our business partner, Ellen Gora. Thank you. Um, Sakia. Hi, all the way from bed -Stuy, Brooklyn. My name is Sakia Dorset. I'm a Bahamian filmmaker. Uh, primarily in documentary. I have made uh, Stonewall 50, The Revolution for NBC News, which won a GLAAD award last year. I've also made the revival Women in the Word that's distributed by Women Make Movies. And I'm working on a feature film uh, narrative. So moving over, that's going to be a YA Christmas comedy caper with lots of queerness. <laughs> so <laughs> looking forward to that um, and getting into that process and love the panel. Thank you so much, Lucy, for us being here. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And to uh, Campbell's point about describing myself, um, I am black, I'm wearing a velvet uh, black top. Um, I have a bold red lip and some braids. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Masashi, over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me on the panel. Hi, everyone. My name is Masashi Nuwano. I am based in San Francisco. I am a festival director, curator for CAM, the Center for Asian American Media. Um, I am a gay male. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, and I am Asian American. I am wearing a sweater with a mountain landscape on it. Um, and I am just happy to be here. Thank you so much. That is a beautiful sweater. <laughs> thank you. Andrea. 
Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Coloma. I am the festival director for Mix Copenhagen, um, based in Copenhagen, <laughs> one of the oldest uh, LGBTQ plus film festivals in the world and the leading LGBTQ plus film festival in the Nordics. Um, yes, I am from Ecuador and yeah, I would like to take on as well what uh, Campbell's great example. Thank you very much. I am, I've chosen the color orange today. Um, I picked a theme. So I'm wearing an orange sweater, an orange lipstick. My hair looks like a mistake because um, COVID has closed down all of the hairdressers. So I'm trying this project where I want to look like a superhero and go completely silver, but I'm actually kind of dark brown and blonde. Yes, and my great. partners are, <laughs> thank you so mm -hmm. much. And my partners are she and her. <laughs> thank you for having me. This is a, a big deal. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is very exciting. Thank you all. Um, I think we can get started by um, sharing who came before us, who we saw when we were coming up, um, when we were making our way up the, the ladder in the industry. Um, who was it that showed us that there, were, there was room for queer BIPOC folks in the film industry? Um, and I suppose there's several ways to approach this. It could be someone who inspired you from a distance, um, but perhaps you've never met in person or someone who was really proactive about making room for you at the table. And whoever feels compelled to jump in first, I would be very grateful. <laughs> um, I, I will go with Sakia speaking. Uh, I think I always thought my work was going to live in an independent space until I saw Pariah and D. Reese. And when I saw D. Reese, that is when I knew that we could move past just the independent phase to the more mainstream phase. Um, and so I had seen the short. And then, of course, when the feature happened, my mind was blown. And I was like, I've got to get on it. Like, if D. Reese can do it, anyone can do it. So, you know, as Andrea is talking about a superhero, to me, D. Reese was my superhero. Um, and that film still resonates with me. Thank you. Um, I can jump in really quickly because I think one gotcha. of the people are actually here and his name is Campbell. And um, I met Campbell five years ago, the last time Campbell was in Copenhagen. And I was actually not part of the festival yet. Um, and I just remember there, there have been very different people in my life as I'm sure it's for everyone here and everyone listening. Oh, and by the way, it's Andrea speaking. But um, definitely Campbell was one of, uh, of the people that I clearly remember and just like, genius was coming out of his mouth and very much teaching me all free labor. I should buy you more beers, Campbell, for all of that. And um, I remember I asked you, I don't know if you remember this, but I asked you, um, what is your favorite queer film? And you said Bound by the Wachowski sisters. And it's fucking great. You were right. I can't watch that film, talk about that film, think about that film um, without you. And uh, I would say that the other person is someone called Max Disgrace that I think maybe is watching. I hope they're right. watching. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have learned recently that um, Campbell, you are their mentor. And uh, they're also a filmmaker, also BIPOC and uh, love them. But just to the point of whether, because this is very much people around me, people that I've looked up to and people whose work um has inspired me um very much pariah like wow one of my favorite films of all time but i think in terms of making space i've had to very much make my own space um i think people are sort of there and maybe they get out of the way but um it's not my experience that a, a loud non-white woman in um in denmark just people don't make space for me i very much have to dig in um, would be my answer to that. That's great. That's uh, very honest. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I feel like crying now. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> God. What can I say? Um, thank you and bless you. And I do hope Max is listening. Um, but um, my, my films, one of them was bound, actually, because I think that's a superb film. And I always say um, that, you know, Jennifer Tilly is the femme vitale 
as opposed to the femme fatale um, because she brings life to, you know, to femininity and feminist in a way that's not subscribed in films and I think could only have come from the Wachowski sisters. Um, but another film um, that was influential for me was Looking for Langston by Isaac Julian. Because when I saw that film, I knew um, something was up. <laughs> I just thought the world is changing, little did I know. But, you know, as Andrea said, I've had to make, you know, Elba my way in um, because we are all, you know, we're all creating vision in a world where there is not a space for our vision. And, you know, we're all muscling our way in. And I think, you know, Andrea's right. We, we, we have kind of, sprinklings of inspiration but it's not en masse and we really have to seek um people out um so i'll i'll, I'll say that it's campbell uh, and this is masashi i'll just say you know i've been uh, a festival director curating for over 15 years and when i first started um, i started early when i was in college and two of the biggest festivals or organizations who um, where life-changing for me was CAM, the Center for Asian American Media, which I'm still at, but also Frameline. And we actually co-own a building together in San Francisco. And when I was very young, being able to not only see all the films at CAM and at Frameline, but also work behind the scenes with the curators, it really gave me this um, uh, inspiration. And I could really envision myself working with these really fantastic people curating films. And then when I moved, I moved to Austin, Texas for many years, and I was really scared and wondering how I would survive in Texas. And PJ Raval, who's an amazing queer Filipino American filmmaker, I met very quickly. And I went from like, how do I survive to how do I thrive? Because he was so good and so um, doing so many amazing things. And in Austin, I realized I could start my own festival. I had that, um, you know, I had that inspiration. So. Um, yeah, those are a few of the key organization people who really inspired me. Thank you. And continue to inspire me, of course. Bianca? Uh, I think it's the same, you know, coming as on the executive side, starting out um, as a stage manager, and then moving into the agency world. Um, someone like myself wasn't uh, there. So I visualized what I'd like a younger version uh, to look up to, um, someone behind me, so that way uh, it wouldn't happen to them and they'd have a, a resource or someone that they could lean into. And um, I did find, though, along the way that there were people who were kind and incredibly brilliant uh, who wanted to uh, give me a hand up and not necessarily a handout. Um, and I uh, was really blessed that those people came in all stages of my career when I was at CAA. It was John Campisi and it was Richard Bovitt. And when I was at STARS, it was uh, Carmi Zalotnik. And I saw from a distance Victoria Alonso at Marvel and um, really was someone who uh, saw me and um, I was able to lean into from time to time. And it also came from Terry Lopez, who's at the Writers Guild, and Alana Mayo, who's at Orion. So it, it kind of came in different forms and in nebulous moments where I um, was looking for what my North Star would be, and they were able to help me clearly see it uh, from time to time. So it was a really an amalgamation of people. That's very beautiful. Thank you. I love that thinking up who we would like to have had to look up to and then embodying that person. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, I had to leave England. There was no opportunity for me there. Um, I couldn't find my way into the industry. And so it wasn't until I got to LA that I found myself in the orbit of really three queer women of color who 
impacted me in my journey. Um, Kim Utani, Shari Frilo, and Roya Rastegar, um, all amazing curators and activists in their own right, um, and have inspired me so much. Let's talk about um, possibilities. And um, if you'll allow me, I would love to play a little bit um, and ask you to use the tool of radical imagination to really rebuild the industry in, in your mind and describe, see if you can describe an ideal version of, of the industry, one that, that we want to work towards getting closer to every day as we build our slates of projects or our festival programs or um, our, next, our next films. Um, I want to hear what that looks like for each of you. What, what are the wholesale changes you wish you could see take place across the industry? Uh, I'll start off. For me, they're not, uh, I don't see them as a radical change. I think that the reason why I say that is because, um, you know, Moises and I created Zone One as a direct response to subverting and repositioning no narratives within the Afro-Latino, the Latinx, and Indigenous space. And to us, even embarking on that was pretty radical enough, um, bending on ourselves, finally. And um, I think as we move forward, it is um, how we are moving through with the creatives that we work with and the space that we are allowing um, things to unfold, in, even in... in things that don't live on the page. And what I mean by that is in real time, our Latino community is coming to terms and grips with itself in terms of how we have been able to pass in certain segments and certain pigmentations of the Latino community, uh, the Latinx community. And that um, has been detrimental, right? And so because our discrimination has been um, non-linear there hasn't been a, a same baseline of discrimination like our brothers and sisters in the african-american community we have to come to grips with what that means and how that's been hurtful to us and why we feel disconnected still and all that is just to say that a radical idea for us is actually happening which is coming to an understanding of that that has happened the historics have been hurtful and that that narrative um, is going to exist somewhere very organically now in terms of how we are creating film and TV content and the characters in which we create and the journeys, more importantly, that they go on will address these things. And so something that I thought and Moises thought was super radical is something that we're doing now because it's a necessity as we kind of come to grips with our identity. Yes, it does yeah, feel like I a necessity. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to add, I mean, I love, uh, Bianca, what you just said. And just to add to that, um, you know, when I think of a more kind of a, a radical envisioning of the future, I, I, I do think that a lot of, uh, for me as a curator, a lot of festivals, um, a lot of programming, you know, we have so many of our different organ um, communities from the LGBTQ community, um, kind of communities that are, or festivals that are based on ethnicity, like for myself, Asian Americans, you know, we have, you know, been pushing against the mainstream system, right? And, you know, really carving our space. Uh, this is the programs, these are the, for us, the best in Asian American filmmakers, we're cultivating that um, and showcasing it. And I think we're getting to a point where we're all so siloed in our own different festival kind of curation in our own communities we serve. And I, I hope that the future is more equitable, that there's so much more intersectionality with different communities coming together. I think that's the best way we, we move forward is um, so many different communities coming together to collaborate. And I want to see festivals being able to reflect that. And I think that is for me, what is radical, a little scary, but really exciting at the same time is how could for us an Asian American festival be a space where you can see a diversity of stories. And if it's Asian Americans, what is that context beyond our own borders? But how do we intersect with other communities of colors, the queer community? Um, and 
if there's amazing films in other communities, I would really love to find ways where we can be a space for that. So I do think, uh, again, so many festivals have been focused on and so mission driven on certain communities and how can we start to broaden that and how can we find bridges to uh, be more inclusive in the stories that we all showcase and support. So that's something on my end. Something that I've I always been very impressed with when it comes to CAM and Frameline is the close relationship of the two festivals. You share a city and you share some some constituents, right? So um, I love that you've also managed to sort of share an office space, resources, staff. And I think that um, that level of generosity is really, um, it's allowing both organizations to be sustainable because obviously it's a, it's a nonprofit world. It's not easy. So I, I really love that model. Um, if I can just quickly uh, jump in, uh, if if I have to think of something, a, a radical change uh, is to free the, free the world if I want to go there. But I would say free the industry from capitalism. I think uh, in many ways, that's the many roots of, of a lot of problems, right? Um, I would be surprised if I was alone in saying that there are some financial considerations that many people have to do. And that, that therefore, because we live in a world that is anti-Black, um, and that centers this heteronormativity. That means that um, every time that we talk about inclusivity and diversity, we kind of forget that they're very much tied into capitalism. So if I think I have to think of a radical change, um, it would be that. I remember I talked to you, Lucy, on the phone a couple of days ago, and we spoke about, you know, who's doing it right. And I think there are a lot of people that are doing it right. And I think there are a lot of festivals that are doing it right. But there is a reason why they are not Berlinale. Not to talk shit about Berlin, love you guys, invite me again, big fan of the festival, <laughs> but um, um, there is a reason why um, festivals that center, let's call it marginalized voices are not the ones that are super renowned. Um, so that's what I would say. And the other thing that I would say is that I would like to see um, BIPOCs everywhere like in every single um, part of the film industry. And not only, for example, this talk is great. I think it's amazing that it's happening. I cannot, I'm gonna probably say this five times throughout this entire talk. Thank you for having me here today. But um, everybody here can speak about so many things when it comes to the film industry. And I keep getting invited to talk about how to include people that look like me and my friends in the film industry. I can talk about a lot of other things and I don't even think that that's radical. That's just like, my email is Andrea at mixcopenhagen.dk, like drop an email, <laughs> it's not that hard. But I, I think that's a, the change. And I think the, the other one that I've been thinking about is maybe like when we look into what diversity and inclusivity is, maybe we also need to look into how these things are connected through structures. So if maybe you're looking for a new programmer or maybe you're looking for to program like a, a, a film section about uh, cutie BIPOCs, uh, maybe there is a reason why the cutie BIPOC person that is applying doesn't have the 10 year experience that the white person that's applying. Um, so uh, yeah, I would love for there to be conversations that actually seep in and don't end up with, okay, we have three black people. So um, yeah, that's at least what I have so far in my head. Thanks, Andrea, that's great. This is I, I love that. Oh, I, oh, oh no. Okay, it's okay. Um, uh, you know, building off what Andrea has said, I think it's there's, there's a few things in there, which is, how do we, we can't, <laughs> capitalism will remain for a little bit, right? Let's just put that out there. Um, we have money, you know, there's money's being exchanged for goods and services, food and water, et cetera. But can the money that's available be um, distributed more equally? Right now, the money is not being distributed equally. Um, and what usually happens is once Hollywood finds the one black person or the one Asian person, they usually funnel all the money to that one person. And when I hear people like, you've closed a hundred million dollar deal, I'm excited. I'm like so excited for that person. But I, but I, thought, but I think to myself, 
wow, how many other folks could have been involved um, so that more voices, because we get to the same issue each time, which is you give money to one person, um, more than likely power would go to that person's head eventually. <laughs> Their politic will start to change and we end up in the same boat that we continue to end up in. So how about the redistribution? A little, so a little socialist filmmaking here where the, the money is being shared more equitably. And then to Andrea's point, once more building off of that, yes, some folks do not have 10 years experience because we are already behind. So how can we put more industry initiatives in place for training? Um, you know, there's the half initiative that's going on. What other initiatives are there? Because so many times people keep saying, and, it's a, and I just wanna say, it is a lie. You cannot just make an incredible film and you will be found. That is a complete lie. It is networking. It is definitely who you know. So I just want people to stop saying that. Another thing I want people to stop saying is you can every, it's democratized. You can make it on your iPhone. Yes, you can make it on your iPhone, but that's also a lie because Netflix would be making every series on an iPhone if that's the case. So I just want people to be honest when it comes to these things. Training is needed, money needs to be shared, and equipment costs money, lenses cost money, audio costs money, we need the money. So get up off the money. That's the, that's the radical, sorry, capitalist vision for me is get up off the money. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Akia. And um, just going off what everybody said and Andrea, I think, you know, I, I, I wonder about the future of capitalism though with COVID. Mm. <laughs> I think, you know, we're going to see some radical shifts in how the economy functions. However, my thing is, um, I think the plantocracy remains. And, you know, uh, we, we thought it ended with the ending of slavery, but the, the power structures are still in place. And when Sakia you talk about, you know, the 100 million deal that's given to the one person, to me, that's the overseer, because that's another gatekeeper. That's a gatekeeper to the actual power. And that's somebody who thinks they have power, but has been given, you know, something by a structure that's on changing already. So how can they change anything when they've taken the money from a structure that hasn't changed? And, and um, people on the outside don't have enough power to explode that. Those saying that, I do think we need to realize we are the majority population on this planet. People of color are the majority. We're not the minority. So, you know, I think it's really important to shift that prism about how we see ourselves and our power base. Also, in terms of economics, we have economic capital and power. What are we doing with it? You know, we also have cultural capital. The Western world is nothing without our spice, basically. We seasoned that culture, which was dry. It was a dry little turkey until... <laughs> We put our little sprinkle our seasonings on it, okay? Everybody needs us. So how do we leverage that um, that cultural capital for the benefit of all of us? And how do we, in a way, decolonize the way we look at ourselves? That, you know, um, Bianca spoke very eloquently and thank you about the kind of gradations in you know um particularly in south america and it happens in the caribbean and um and the usa of colorism and the proximity to whiteness um gives people access to certain power that you know a lot of our bipoc or people of color whatever are utilizing in order to gain power but not for the not for everybody else so i would say a radical thing would be to think like maybe Romaine la Prophetesse, who was a trans woman um, uh, re revolutionary in Haiti, who was part of the, the Haitian revolution. You know, you can also Google that shit. <laughs> because, you know, 
imagine in the Haitian Revolution, there was a trans woman. Think about it. Back in the day, we were included in revolutions. In revolutions, what what has happened? Why why have we become a replica of the very structures that we claim are excluding us? So that's my challenge. How? And I don't know the answer, and I would love to hear maybe people um, you know who've um, come to this um, discussion. How can we change the structures that are truly inclusive of everyone, acknowledging everyone's power base? And to me, that means, you know, people who are disabled as well, people who are neurodivergent, people of different ages, because we've come from cultures that don't only value youth, we value wisdom and age. Where is that replicated? How are we, how are we really being radical? And how are we being radical um, that not seeing the value of a person by how much wealth they have accrued, but how much wisdom and knowledge they have. So that's my um, that's my thing about kind of thinking radically, for me, anyway. And I'm very Thank excited. To be here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I can talk about other things. <laughs> oh, we all can. Oh my <laughs> jokes, jokes. <laughs> But I think I love what you said about, you know, we are the marginalized majority, right? And um, I firmly believe that queer BIPOC folk are community builders by nature. And, and so when we're given responsibility, we instinctively act as gate openers, not gatekeepers. We, we help to level the playing field just by empowering more people like us to enter the industry. And so I dream of more of us in leadership roles and um, more of us being given the the power to green light movies and and dictate where grant funding goes and and that's that way we'll see you know the the landscape the film landscape change um i hope that's coming um i i feel like there is a there's certainly an, an awareness now that wasn't there a year ago can I quickly just add something that I also thought about in terms of, and I don't know if this is very radical, but I think I would also love to see white people, white Westerners, um, especially have conversations like the one that we're having right now. I would love to hear what their radical ideas of change are, because I've definitely, and maybe that's one of the, some of the challenges that you asked us to think about, but that just reminded me that I have definitely been in very, in, in very, a lot of situations where something is done one way, which equals that the people that have power and visibility and jobs keep getting that power and that visibility in those jobs. And then I think, what? It, and I'm not saying that I am the grandmaster of ideas, but I, it's just an idea. And I'm like, what if we do this instead? And I get, well, that doesn't make sense or that hasn't been done before. And I'm like, well, yeah, because if you want the same results, okay. So I think it, at the end of the day, I also believe that racism is white people's problems because they created it. So I would really, I would, I would pay money to see a talk of a bunch of white people in power telling me what their radical ideas are to give us grants and money and careers and jobs. Um, yeah. So if you know that, hit me up. I'm very interested. That's a very good point. Yeah. But I'd like them to just not talk, but give us the money and jobs. <laughs> In a way. The talk, stop the talk now. They talked. They talked a lot. <laughs> and they put up their black squares. So right. They made their public statements. <laughs> now what? Show me the money. Like what Sakia said, you know, show me the money. At the end of the day, that's what's not happened, this um, redistribution of, of, of wealth. And I would say, you know, in terms of filmmaking, one of the things is, what I notice is the power is still remaining in certain creative hands. So you'll get white or cis normative people um, making films with um, black um, lead characters or queer um, people of color lead characters. And they're doing very well off, again, off our backs in a kind of colonizing power structure, which hasn't changed, but they lack the nuance because they don't surround themselves with people who actually or, or employ the people who have the vision, who understand the cultures that they're coming from. I'll give one example. 
very often I see black characters get on a bed in a house with shoes. I'm like, oh, oh, honey, that is not going to happen. So, I, and I can know instantly who was the producer, director, art director, everybody. Because it don't happen. We do, we do, sometimes we don't even come into our house with clothes we have outside. That's just one point. I'm sorry. <laughs> no need to apologize. Thank you. It's true. We, we clock these inaccuracies daily, right? Um, so it's, it's in the industry's best interest to enroll us creatively in the, in the, in the crafting of, of these films and TV shows and so they can get it right. Um, I, when, when I reached out to all of you originally, I asked you to read a, a short text. Um, the Ford Foundation recently enlisted artists and thought leaders um, to imagine a different landscape for their craft. And E.R. Bo Boyd's article felt particularly re res resonant and relevant to what we're discussing. Um, E.R. Bo, of course, is a filmmaker and the founder of Brown Girls Dark Mafia. Um, so I want everyone at home to sort of make a note of, to go and look that up. I'll read a little bit of it here just to get us started. But um, yeah, that's, that's something for you to all go and Google afterwards. For production company executives, buyers, funders, agents, curators, etc., how have systemic racism, sexism, and classism permeated their career tracks? Where do the barriers to success and advancement lie, especially for mid-career and senior levels, and who is responsible? How have these experiences caused professional, psychological, and financial damage that might discourage BIPOC executives, especially women and non-binary folk, from pursuing the careers they truly desire and from seeking positions of power? So I wanted to read that just to lead us into the next topic, which is, to talk about the barriers that we've faced. And I'm wondering if each of you would share one or two um, problematic experiences, I know it's hard to narrow them down, um, that you've had over the course of your careers that felt specifically related to your identity. Um, I know I'm asking for a lot of vulnerability here, so I truly appreciate it. Yeah, I, I can go first. Um... <laughs> you know thank you for the team <laughs> yeah um i think that my um my very existence and being a latina of color who is a lesbian was uh a challenge when i first started in this business right for me at least because i was the only one that knew all those things um, about myself. Um, I also do think that I don't of any time overlook that my lesbianness and my appearance of passing perhaps could have helped me um, along the way, because I know that that has been detrimental to a lot of um, my sisters who don't pass, right? Um, and um, you know, in answer to your question, what are like one or two moments? I think it, for me, it was the entire uh, trajectory of me going into a place um, that the agency that I once worked at and navigating to doing the things that I was able to do. And I faced difficulties along the way. And I'm not really pinpointing one example. I hope this overarching example is helpful to people. Um, the way that I was um, faced with it was uh, these microaggressions that become pricks, that become chips, that I think people may hope that um, get you down, right? Um, and I have found that it was the... Um, the ability that they saw in me that I did, that they didn't have, right? That they were essentially threatened to some degree. Um, a lot of the times they were um, 
people who weren't pigmented, right? People who weren't of color who were threatened. And I say this because my hope in tandem with the radical future is that people stop seeing each other for what they don't have as a threat and realize that your position of power is one that should enable people behind you and next to you to thrive and flourish because it actually grows the bottom line of your business um, just on a brass tax sense. And the, uh, the way that I was able to overcome it was I made a conscious decision very early on um, that I wasn't going to allow that energy or that negativity to define what I wanted my imprint to be in this business, but rather I would use it as a catalyst so that other people wouldn't experience what I had gone through because I saw my future and the future that I wanted to share with others to be apropos to that. So I, I'll keep my specific example very broad as a way to not um, start an AA session, but in, in hopes that people can can see and learn and grow from moments that weren't positive uh, inherently. This is Sakia speaking. Well, number one, when you pose that question, I immediately realize I need to call my therapist again. <laughs> you know, I've worked in this industry for a bit, definitely on the TV side. And there is a level of toxicity that exists within television marketing that is actually scary to even think about. Um, to Bianca's point, people are always threatened by people of color that have an opinion. If you are a black woman and you are assertive and you're not coming and cowering or coming to the table with um, doubt in your voice, you are arrogant, you are um, too assertive, you are, you know, those end of year reports are always very enlightening when it comes to um, working as a leader in the industry. And I think it's because we haven't had a reckoning. So the first reckoning we've had is a racial reckoning. The second reckoning of Hollywood is a toxicity reckoning. People with bad behavior that have thrived and that have terrorized BIPOC individuals for decades, and they continue to rise to the top. People that run programming on their channel and are presidents, and they claim that they are very friendly because they choose and cherry pick the right type of Black person, the right type of BIPOC person. And I just want to say, that sometimes when you see those um, elevations, it's because they're choosing folks that are in alignment with their politic. So as we sit here, we're talking about BIPOC representation, we really have to also talk about type of political approach to your life and what that means. If you are aligning with the toxicity and the whiteness, I mean, and you're a BIPOC. It's almost like a scene out of um, Lovecraft Country where the woman is living in the white body, right? Like that's what we have most times. And so, you know, I recently dealt with a situation like this where working on a campaign that was supposed to be for a particular, um, you know, purpose and, you know, someone that was, again, a bi Again, assuming a BIPOC nature, I feel like I need to make a movie out of this. Like you are in the position and you're still speaking with the whiteness. There is a, that is something that we need to address. So, you know, there's a, a popular thing that everybody knows it's called all skin folk aren't kin folk. So as we talk about BIPOC representation, I also want us to talk about radical BIPOC representation because BIPOC representation is not enough if you are aligned in whiteness and you are put in that position because you know that you are not going to stir the pot. White people do not like people stirring the pot and they definitely don't like truth. Two things that I've discovered 
in my now, God, 10, 12, 15, 15 plus years of working in television. So that needs to be a conversation. What does a ra radical BIPOC representation look like? What does that look like? Not just BIPOC, because we have that sometimes and we still have a problem. I completely yeah. agree. I think that also, not always, but in my observations and in my talks with people, I think that also tends to happen when there's like a one that gets hired or a couple that gets hired. Um, it's quite rare that um, even in, in mix, even though we are a volunteer, or I call it pro bono um, instead of calling it volunteer, but um, I definitely think that tends to happen when there isn't sort of like a leadership or, or a group but uh, sort of singles hired here and there that uh, tend to not always uh, collaborate or communicate um, with each other. But uh, back to the question about the barriers, I don't know, no, I know. I don't wanna make myself this vulnerable um, to my computer. Maybe if you people were IRL in front of me, but to my computer, maybe maybe feels too 2020 to do that. <laughs> Um, but so I don't, and I also don't want to drag people, but that being said, <laughs> so he has like drag, drag all of them. Now we, I can call you later, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Side note. Did you hear that at Gen C when they, instead of doing calling, they do like this. Isn't that mad? Sorry. We can talk about that later. Sorry. Back to the actual point that Lucy is trying to make us talk about. Um, I think. I also going off with Bianca said, I am very passing. I am cis. Um, my proximity to whiteness is like two Fenty shades away. Um, I'm very ambiguous. Um, so, and I think that needs to be definitely recognized and acknowledged. So I don't believe that I have faced as near as many challenges as I could have, um, or as other people do. And I don't think that it's coincidence that I am the first QD BIPOC to be the festival director of MIX. If it had to be a BIPOC, I am not, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's me. Um, so I, but I do believe that the main challenges that I have experienced within the film industry, I think I can boil them down to two things. One, what Sakia said, um, I am very opinionated. I am loud. Um, I am very confident when I have to be, if I know what I'm talking about and my work speaks for itself and people don't like that. Um, especially white, cis, straight men do not like that. And I have had to fight that so much. I am, I am happy and I'm grateful that I have a, a team either within the QD BIPOC community in Copenhagen, but also my team in MIX, um, that supports me, but it. I have had to deal with being, I think it's part of the dehumanizing process, right? I cannot be a human that's nice and has feelings and at the same time be assertive and, and all of that because humanity is not necessarily given to, to people like us. Um, and I would say that's one reason. Um, <clears throat> and the other reason, I forgot. It will come back to you. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, okay, Andrea. But... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just love what people, this is like a kind of healing session, <laughs> just around the fire, isn't it? Um, and I think, I, I just want to acknowledge what people have said before has been really powerful. And what I would say, you know, to, there, there is a difference between passing and, and femininity, but also with the femininity comes anger because of assertion. There's a sort of, you know, there's basically we get punished. <laughs> everybody gets punished for different reasons, but everybody gets punished. So I, I, I wanted to say that and, you know, adding on from what Sakia said. I can speak specifically about <clears throat> my journey with stud life which was, um, you know, quite, and I, and I want to, to use this as a way for other filmmakers coming up in the spirit that Bianca 
mentioned that it is possible. So I, I, you know, wrote my film, put it in to get finance and was told there wasn't a market for it. Now, that, that in itself um, gives you an idea of who makes the decisions, but it's not about bodies, as Sakia was saying. You can have a whole group of BIPOC people who are gatekeepers, but what are their politics? And you can have a whole group of white people who have more radical politics and inclusive politics than those of the BIPOC people who will exclude, exclude queer, um, <clears throat> transsexual, intersex um, people of color. So we have to also acknowledge that it's not just about skin color, it's also about mindset. It's also about, you know, what um, Masashi was saying, you know, when we think of, let's say, Asian, <clears throat> what does that mean? Does that mean only from a certain part of the world and not from Brazil or not from the Caribbean? You know, what do we mean? What do we actually mean by these, these labels that we have? When we say Caribbean, for me, Caribbean means everybody. It literally means everybody. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it, it, it's like, the thing we have to think about is power. So going back to stud life, it got rejected. And what I did was I had a reading, to cut a long story short, we, I had a reading with um, some friends of mine who gave me notes. And from those notes, I dredged up something because I was on the floor. When you get rejected from something, and I'd have seen so many rejections, with, and I was just like, oh, my God. What's, you know, am I really a filmmaker? Can I make films? Like, maybe I'm writing shit, you know. So you start to have a lot of those feelings because, you know, you just think, well, I just thought I'm no good. And I think that's what happens if you receive this exclusion somehow um, because we are, we seek validation from the very structures. This is what I was talking about, the structures. So if you're excluded, you think, well, maybe I'm not good because I was trained you know, in the industry, and so and then I thought from my ancestors, my mother, my father, my family, inside me, I was like, I'm going to make this movie. So I made the film with crowdfunding, um, which was relatively new at the time, and also um, took out a loan from the bank, So, <laughs> which it took me years to pay back that loan, let me tell you. But, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the moral of the story is do not seek validations from these motherfuckers because they are set up to sabotage us. They are set up, like Toni Morrison said, it's a distraction. It's there to weaken us, to make us feel bad and to make us give up. Giving up, we, we can't give up. You know, we have to keep kind of popping up like the Terminator. <laughs> you know, yes, can't and my ancestors are maroons, man. You know, they <laughs> anyway. I will not go there. So the, the, and then <laughs> the the film showed at Fusion for the very first time, and I was really nervous because it's a very British film. But the Americans got it, and it was Americans of color who got the film, who understood every single thing about that film. I was shocked. Because what we hear in the UK about Americans is, yeah, it's ignorant. You don't know nothing. <laughs> right? But you've got stud life. Netflix picked it up. The rest is history. So the other thing is, don't believe people. Believe yourself. Believe in yourself. First, visualize what you want to do and see how you can have the steps to bring people along. A lot of people came on my journey with stuff like because I was like, I was like this. It has to be made. I was so blinkered, and it took me years to recover, but I made it, and I'm here because of that film. You know, I I I, I met Lucy. You know, I met Andrea. So it's like, and I'm meeting you all now by Zoom. This is the only way we're gonna meet. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> That's that's the way of the world. But I want people to realize everything is possible. We, 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 we face many limiting kinds of narratives because of who we are. I want us to think in an expansive and a big way because of who we are. I want to call out just quickly that... Sorry? 
I said that could be a TED talk by itself. We just have to have Campbell X do a TED talk. You know, great. <laughs> is the name of the TED talk, Campbell. I love it. And I just wanted to say that, that Campbell's film, Start Life, now those very institutions and organizations that said, no, there's no audience for this, are holding it up as an example of the best Black British film in the past decade or more. Yeah, and what they ignore this thing. <laughs> but that's to show you. And, and, and to give you another thing, the party we had at the first screening in the UK people were crying to get in and my suit my producer said Campbell if people won't let you into their dry ass party that's Louima who's wonderful she, she said to me make your own damn party and make it so good they'll want to join your party and I remember that from what she said to me oh thank you yeah oh. no go 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 okay I'll be quick on my end, um, I, I, and it's very hard to follow Cam Black. That it was wonderful what you just said. Um, I, I just wanted to briefly say that um, you know I probably mirror a lot of people in the audience and people in this panel. Growing up, um, being a person of color and queer, being um, discriminated against so much that you start to have this like trauma of going into a room with anyone new, assuming anything coming your way that might be negative is based in that. And I mentioned that because when I, I mentioned earlier when I moved to Texas, um, when I started a film festival there, the Austin Asian American Film Festival, I had to, I didn't know really anyone and going into whether it was sponsor meetings or meeting city officials, I had that. And in hindsight and through some therapy, I realized that some of that was there, but some of it was not and it's inside us, right? And I realized though, after my time in Austin, um, that I did a lot of hustling and I did a lot of kind of ambitious things. And I do think that being a person of color and queer, it, it forced me to be bold. It forced me to put an armor on. It, it, it gave me some inspiration there to be as, um, strong as I can be. And I do think for people in the audience to remember there's an inner strength in all of us when you have these hurdles in front of us or uh, always in front of us uh, to use that as inspiration. And I, I want to mention that as a curator, for people who are making your films and if you feel like you don't have support or if you come from a BIPOC community and you are worried that your stories are not going to be uh, respected. I, I will say through the hundreds to thousands of films that I see, whenever I see a, a film coming from a person of, from a marginalized community, those are the first ones I want to see. I am looking for these stories. These are the uh, stories that I think festivals and people are looking for, right? They're, um, and anyways, so I, I encourage people when you have a story, please, do as much as you can to have that story, um, you know, told because there are people who are looking for those and finding ways to support you. So, absolutely. I just want to add that, yeah, absolutely to everything, because um, those are also the stories that I look for, I prioritize, that I want, and I also want to since. I don't know who's watching this, but I think it's good if there are filmmakers, if there are anyone that wants to get into the industry, if there's anything that I can do, my DMs are always open. And I always say that whenever I can at any talk that I'm invited is because people open their DMs for me. Um, so my DMs are open for whoever needs any, whatever little I can do. Um, I am also the one, it's so sad that now the queer industry reception, it can't happen because of COVID. But every time I go, I find all the BIPOCs and I talk to all of them first. Um, and I, I just I just think that's really important. Um, but then what I've remembered that I forgot <laughs> was that the other sort of barrier that I have faced that I've seen other people face is experience, which I talked a little bit about before. Um, and it's the fact that I can speak for myself, but also from other people. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be because I am a QD BIPOC, but also 
Um, it has a lot to do with class. I'm, I'm also a migrant. I migrated to this country when I was 14 years old. Um, I always say my mom kidnapped me, but no, I very much moved with her. Um, and I am the child of migrants. I was also a migrant in the States. I lived there for a couple of years. And I had to make decisions about my life um, that had to do a lot with safety and a lot with the protection. And, and that doesn't necessarily equal to 10 years of experience in whatever film industry job I want to have um, because life doesn't work like that. And, and I think I wish that that was a barrier that we could maybe drop. And back to what Sakia was saying, training, like um, I might not know shit, but I can learn shit. Like just train me, like it's not hard. <laughs> um, because I, I think experience and education can sometimes be really huge barriers where we're talking about um, class, we're talking about migrants, we're talking about um, refugees, and then all of a sudden we're saying that certain career paths and certain dreams cannot be attainable um, simply because you chose to, you know, pick a career that maybe was safer or, yeah, because we, I, I think I can speak for all of us that making money in film is not necessarily the easiest thing. Um, yeah. Well said, thank you. But yeah, I think can I can I say something Lisa? Go for it. just to that? I think training, yes, but bearing in mind people of colour are one of the most trained people. I know <laughs> you know, a lot of people get film jobs, not because of their training, but because of who they know. Right? Let's be honest about that. But it's interesting that the people of colour need the training. Right? I'll just leave that there. Yeah, there's a lot to say about the dreaded um, shadowing programs that never actually lead to a paying job. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to highlight so many things that were said. I think, um, yes, the, the, the sort of well-documented research that's been done on, on women of color speaking out professionally and being labeled as troublemakers. That's, that's a massive thing that we contend with. Um, the, yes the cognitive tax that we feel when we're trying to do a good job in our roles while also constantly feeling evaluated and judged and uh, wondering how we're being perceived as the only queer person in the room or the only BIPOC person in the room. I've certainly had that experience of, of being the only non-white and only queer person on staff at a festival or at a production company and um, it's isolating it's so much pressure to speak to have to speak to um, to represent all your communities at one time. Um, and I don't know if you've all felt this at one point, but it also feels like hyper visible in a very uncomfortable way, like we're being used mm -hmm. to validate the organization or the company as like mm -hmm. cultural currency or something. Um, whenever I um, in, come to learn of a new company or an organization, I go and look at the staff pages on their website and I see who, who are they paying and <laughs> what does their team look like? And if it's, if I see a sea of white faces and only one or two by pop folk um, and no one who's visibly queer, I think it's just like they've hired by like checking boxes and it doesn't feel organic. They think they've hired these few people and the job is done, inclusion done. And I, I just want to see more and more companies where maybe the the cis het white folk are in the minority, <laughs> and there's just a, a multiplicity of identities out there. Um, a friend of mine just recently joined a, a company in New York that is BIPOC owned and majority BIPOC staffed, and I had never even imagined a space like that. It was such a revelation to me to to hear her talk about it, and I thought, wow. Yeah, I've worked in an all queer space, but I haven't had this particular experience and that's something I'd love to feel. Um, I think I'd like us to, to move on to our next topic, which is to talk about our impact, the impact we want to have professionally. And this is our last um, big question and then we'll just check in on what questions are coming in from the audience. Um, so, Thinking about our professional futures, it can be as vague or as specific as you like, but I'd love to hear what, what resonates with you, what, what's calling you, what you'd like your working life to look like for your future self. Should I start? 
Um, on a micro level, um, within our company, because that's top of mind for, for me and, and my is, um, to put in, and everyone, I know I'll preface this by saying everyone within the LGBTQ plus space, uh, who are creative have their own much respected, uh, unique way of talking and examining and looking at. Uh, our very community and the appearance of our community varies. For us, we um, are very uh, committed to having, especially trans characters, just be part of the world. And if you catch the individual, if you are able to see that they are actually going through an experience that is unique to their community, then you've caught it. And if you haven't, you are still witnessing uh, a character's arc, full, unencumbered by a trope or a stereotype. Um, and I specifically bring up trans because uh, we would hate to be a part of the regurgitation that happened with the hypersexualization of lesbians and the sometimes um, objectification and demonization to some point in our cinematic history with um, our gay uh, brothers and sometimes identifying sisters. So I bring that up on a, on a micro level and something that we want to start to really do more of. Um, we have it in some places uh, in terms of appearance and some of the projects that we have set up, but definitely that's a micro thing. On a macro level, um, to create more seats at our table, to a point that was brought up by Campbell, you know, yes, it's true. The business wasn't designed for people like us to succeed because historically our stories haven't showed up. So inherently we must create our own tables and bring out our own seats and help people make their own chairs so they can have a seat at our table and our table can be as wide and as long. And there are not limitations on the number of seats um, because we're designing it communally, collectively. And um, that's kind of the, the future that I uh, hope to be part of a cog in a wheel is that we're able to bring people into our own never ending table that has equal amount of equity, especially because streaming services allow a multitude of stories to be told in a way that we've never seen before. Mm. I can go next. Um, before I kind of give my answer, I wanted to just do a quick plug. I, I've been talking about Texas a lot, and hope, uh, and I'm realizing I hope I'm not putting a negative um, impression of Texas. You know, I just want to quickly <laughs> say that you know there there's a lot of amazing people who I met there, and the community that I was able to that become friends with there are. are just really amazing. And I mentioned them because as we talk about radical queerness um, and envisioning a more equitable future, there is a festival there called Outsider Fest that starts tomorrow. Um, it's virtual so people can participate. If you wanna know what radical queerness looks like in Texas, please check them out, Outsider Fest. Um, and as far as my own professional work, I have been on many panels. I have produced many panels um, and I've been seeing a lot of panels throughout the decades just about changing the industry and I think there is such anxiety and questions about it that we are many of us are stuck in the envisioning dreaming stage and I think and I see a lot of filmmakers and a lot of festivals moving into the implementation part you know all the big movements that happen whether it's in cinema or beyond there's it just you have to take action to make it happen, right? You can't keep talking about it. And so I think for myself, all the things that we have talked about here and that I've talked about separately with um, different folk is to make it happen. Like, how can we make a more equitable future? How can we be more inclusive? How can we support filmmakers, storytellers, and community who have um, historically not received support? Um, you know, I think there is a, 
it can be fun to dream about it. I think what's hard is implementing it. And I think that's the part where I think myself and a lot of other organizations and festivals, festivals are ready to do. So um, I think that's the part where I hope in the next few years, we move past the point of, at least for us, of what can we do to serve our larger community into this is what we have done now. And this is now the next future for us. Um, Thank you. Campbell, I know that <clears throat> something that you and I talked about is that you have made a very um, specific choice in your work to, to stay working within what feel like safe spaces for you, working within your community and not sort of interacting in the, the mainstream whiteness. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because you sort of created an ideal, it seems like, set environment for queer BIPOC folk? Well, um, I wanted to talk about Wahala Film Fund, which um, was set up by myself and Neela Booman, um, and also on our selection panels, Kaza Rose and um, Kim Tatum. So Wahala Film um, Fund is a completion fund uh, set up for cutie BIPOC people um, making films that center cutie BIPOC stories and characters and it's for short films and we found that you know it's easy well it's not easy it's quote unquote easier to shoot but the the post-production and the finishing bits are, are much more problematic which is why we chose to do that so that you know um Masashi spoke about implementation and that's one of our interventions. And anybody knows the word wahala means trouble. It's like slang. It's Caribbean slang. But I think it's also African um, for trouble, basically. And so we're troublemakers and we're embracing that loud troublemaker. In my life, I also mentor filmmakers. And it's like people would think mentor young, but I mentor people of different ages because I just think you can start at different stages in your life depending on, you know, where you are in your life and you know for a lot of cutie bipop people as um <clears throat> masashi mentioned we come with trauma and we come with also trying to figure out who we are and the back the, the kind of those psychological infightings with ourselves also affect the confidence to enter into the shark infested waters of of filmmaking yeah so um, we might not be the, the whiz kid at, you know, 18, because at 18, we might face other barriers, you know, on top of class or gender appearance or gender identity. So, you know, you know, as Andrea said, we won't come with the 10 years experience by the time we're like, you know, 22 or whatever, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I jest. But, you know, um, so these things need to be kind of inbuilt within systems to understand from whence we are coming and don't use a white cis heteronormatively middle class um, benchmark to measure the whole world by yeah so that's one thing so um, for me personally I am I'm currently working with a production company called Smoking Dogs with a wonderful producer called Ashita Kamfra and um, we're work working together on a project and they have, a, Smoking Dogs has a long history of um, making <clears throat> films that center the black experience, okay? So um, for me, I am I'm concerned with my own work of centering people of color. And I don't mean just from characters, from a base in my own spiritual journey and my own understanding of myself, my history, my ancestry, the diaspora around, how can I be faithful and um, affirming and rejuvenating to, to us in a way? And it doesn't mean I do hagiographies, and it doesn't know if people know my work, it, you know, it is challenging and it's very queer and it's um, sex positive and kink positive. So I'm not this sort of, um, you know, cutie bipop person who, I, and, and I suppose that's why I'm, I don't put myself in the mainstream because mainstream tends to be quite sex negative when it comes to queer sexuality. It's like they like us as long as we're not having sex and we're sort of defanged and 
and and then it's like, oh yeah, come in, nice queers, and I'm <laughs> I'm a dirty queer, so um, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why. So I'm censoring, sen well, not dirty all the time, but I try. <laughs> it's COVID after all. Anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> I'm just queer in the panel, honey. We need to do that. <laughs> um, so um, it, it, it's centering like. From whence I came, my ancestry, honoring queer ancestry of color through me, like I'm the channel, and I channel that through the work. Um, and if the mainstream wants to come to my party, come. There's like, we don't serve hummus and chips. You know, we, <laughs> we have good food. We have plate of food <laughs> for all year. Amazing. Thank you. I think that um, some of the things that are coming up as you all are talking are this realization that there is very little support for our stories out there. There's You see so many film funds dedicated to female directors, and now that's in some cases expanded to female directors and non-binary filmmakers. There's nothing for trans filmmakers. There, that program does not exist. That film fund has not been created yet, and that's a blind spot for the industry. That's a, a whole um, wealth of stories that are not being told. Um, and I think that it sort of speaks to a, an industry that's still very resistant to um, people who are outside the, the gender binary. So I hope to see that change. Um, and I hope to see more, more stories that sort of uphold our, the dignity and humanity of our communities. Um, still, just a few weeks ago, um, in the festival that happens in January, <laughs> there was a lesbian, a very high profile lesbian movie where there was a tragic ending. And I was like, really, do we, do we need to do this again? We, I, we've had decades of this story being rehashed. And I think it's time for upbeat stories. Let's have some trans romantic comedies or lesbian romantic comedies. Like, let's, let's change it up <laughs> um, from the programming side, from... I'm a recovering producer from that side as well. Like I'm just seeing um, there are all these stories that need to be told that are not happening yet. And so that's sort of my message out into the world. Someone, mm -hmm. investors, come fund these stories. <laughs> Can I just quickly jump in? Um, yes to everything you're saying. Or two things. One, very quickly, I want to see some sex in film. Like I want to see some like actual sex. I don't want to see curtains. I don't want to see some weird ass head somewhere. I don't like, I want to see people getting dirty, having sex for two hours. That's what I want to see. That is my, I don't know if that's my impact. If that is the impact I'm going to have from this panel, give me some sex. Give me, I just watched a film. I don't want to say names because I again don't want to drag, but I saw a film the other day. Really liked it. Really liked it. Um, I see a lot of, it's, it's a lesbian film I see a lot of penis I don't see vagina I see hand and the penis I don't see hand in the clit so that is my I am now loudly asking the industry give me some sexy thank you um yes <laughs> but as to what you as to the the impact I've been thinking about that a lot and I don't know what impact I want to have because I have zero goals for myself I should work on that but it made me think a lot about the impacts that some of the people that are working here in Denmark can have and are having. The first person I thought about was uh, Patricia Balibandak. She's a Ugandan Danish woman who is the first African woman to graduate from the Danish film school a couple of years ago. Yes, we're in Denmark. It's, yes. Um, she's made this fantastic uh, documentary short about her family and now she has more things um, in the run uh, coming out soon that I'm very, very excited to see. And I think already there she's had a lot of uh, impact, as well as my other good friend, Ayun Nin, who is not a filmmaker, but she is a poet and a writer and an artist. Um, I think both of them and has been called a rare talent in the Danish literature scene. Um, she's from Angola. I think both of them are having like gr a great impact in, in, in this country and very much giving um, pictures for young talent to see themselves in. Um, the first question that we were asked about who did we see in the film industry that inspired us, I don't want to ever erase people that came before me. I will never do that. 
but I do want to say that I didn't see them. If they were there, I didn't see them. I came to know them later. Um, and because of the work that people like Patricia and Ayun are doing, there's a new collective, a film collective called Uhar Kalechu, which translates to Unheard Collective. And it's a collective of completely um, cutie by pug people. Um, and they are cooking some stuff up and uh, really engaged and going to the meetings and getting the funding. And I think we're going to see some great stuff coming from them. So I know that sometimes when we can have these talks, we can talk about the challenges and stuff, but I do see, and, and if I have to talk in my context, I do see a lot of people grinding and, and doing their thing, a lot of cinematographers, industry i wanted i wanted more programmers that are cutie bipoc in this country so we can have like a little gang um but in terms of the film industry i i see a lot and it makes me very happy we're working on the on the programming side right with the programmers of color collective Move here. <laughs> um i i think uh from from my work and I, when we talk about radical i think it's going to be radical when we have a plethora of different types of work um so all different sex positive vaginas, mord vaginas, all represented it. Uh, I personally would love to uh, represent LGBTQ families more. Um, I would love for us to have our own series that we can see ourselves. I mean, there's so many people that's just living, you know, and um, I don't want the trauma. I just want queer people living their lives and having regular old issues of why didn't you pay the bill? What's going on? I thought you said you were going to pay the light bill. Like I, I want to just have that be like, a, no, I don't, I don't want to say normalization because we normalization is a, a, the worst word ever. I want to say, um, I want us to join in the conversation so that, uh, queer films can be so many different things. And the sadness is if you've been in the pandemic, which we all have, looking for those films on streaming platforms. If you look on Netflix, you go through, if you type in lesbian, you've already seen all of them. Mm -hmm. If you go to Prime Video, you've already seen all of them. Then there's Shran releasing, you've already seen all of them. So clearly we are, we need a way um, to move all the films that come out of film festivals every year, because we have New Fest, we have Outfest, we have Mardi Gras, we have Mix. All these films need to find a home somewhere. Um, and they're not finding a home. So I also think that is something we need to figure out. Why can I see that feature film in October, whatever, and then I never see it again, ever, 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 ever in life? Like, how can we get all of those films that have already happened onto streaming platforms so that we can see them and they can live. Um, I'm done speaking. Oh, I want to this plug. If you're on Clubhouse, please join me at Queer Film TV Art Club. Every Wednesday night at eight, we talk about queer film. And is Clubhouse that good? Is it that good that you're plugging Clubhouse in? Amazing. Okay. amazing. Okay. And Campbell, please send me your phone number. I'm going to send you an invite so we can have a conversation about stud life. All right, well, God, making connections. Global. I love this. <laughs> what it's all about global, global. Yes, we are almost at the end, but we have one question. So I just want to throw it out to you all. Um, John asks, I am a white queer screenwriter. I'm working on a World War II project with a non binary hero based on a true story. Um, the script is incredibly gender diverse, but it does not yet feature BIPOC characters. Um, how do I find a way to include BIPOC characters in an authentic and truthful manner? Should I approach BIPOC filmmakers about this topic? Yes, and hire them. Hire a BIPOC writer. Um, yes, find them. Facebook, LinkedIn, Grindr. I have seen, okay, I'm not a Grindr, but I know of people that I have shared like open calls on Grinder, but I would say definitely find yourself a writer. Um, if you don't know how to do it, you don't have to. We don't have to know how to do things. We're not the masterminds of everything. Get help. Get a get a BIPOC writer. I'm sure there's tons wherever you are. We tend to be all over the place. 
So go find yourself one. Yes, and I would say share the share the title, share the paycheck, share the power. But dear John, whatever happens, do not just insert a character yourself in that script. Um, do what Disclosure did, which is make sure that on every level you have someone represented. So if John, if you're not uh, a non-binary person, that's another thing. Please make sure you have a non-binary person on your team. Um, and then also, it's not just the script. Make sure you have a non-binary person and a BIPOC person on the set. Make sure you have a non-gender non-binary person and BIPOC person watching the fight, the cuts. Like, it's not just tapping into us for, you know, quick advice and being like, oh, great. Thank you so much. And here's 500 bucks. All the best. It's bringing us along for the ride till the end so that you make sure that you don't end up with what Campbell X said, although I don't know what happened in World War II, but people of color on the bed with the shoes because we know about the outside clothes. So just want to throw that out there to John and congratulations, John. And I'm glad that we're getting another um, uh, film about the past for, for us. But I also want like very much what Sakia is saying, because if we agree that a film is made by different parts, so like the writing and the editing and the color grading and the lighting and everything, and we talk about inclusivity of, of cutie BIPOCs, then they have to be included in the entire process, whether that's one person, whether there are several people. And absolutely, if there's money, share the money. If there's whatever, share that. Um, because if not, then you're just using someone for their story and then kind of just leaving them there. And <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to say was that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I should have gotten more water. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say about that, John, is that if, if you do get, and I hope you do get uh, a BIPOC person in your team, have conversations. There are things you're not gonna know. And you need, to, I think I learned this from, well, my own experience by my friend, Patricia, that I just talked about, said it really well. She's has uh, open conversations with her producer, who's a white man. And she's like, okay, now you can ask anything. Like, let's go, let's have an open conversation so we can work together. Cause you're not gonna know everything. So have an open conversation with the BIPOC and the non-binary person that, or persons that join your team before, before you engage in movie making. Engage in movie making safely. The history of queer BIPOC communities has not been valued. Um, at a level that is acceptable. <laughs> and I think that there are, um, when you talk about queer BIPOC people, there's a long legacy and there are a lot of untold stories. So I do think if that is a mission of yours, if you really do want to incorporate a character or a story, my sense is there's some out there. So I think that doing additional research, checking in with different cultural organizations, community groups, um, and to find out what are those stories. I mean, I think that would be a really uh, exciting opportunity for you to engage with people who went through that experience, hopefully, and to be able to tell those stories, that seems very powerful. Um, so I would encourage that. And then yes, to what everyone says, it's one thing to have a story, it's another thing to tell that story authentically. And, um, and so having a diverse crew is so um, critical. But having, you know, um, the person having power, <laughs> because one can include as many people of color and, and cutie BIPOC people, if they have no power within that structure, it's tokenism, you know. And so, John, be careful of that. You know, you're going to have to now open up your project in a way, open up the ownership of your product project to somebody not you who comes from a different um, identity and community so it's like how are you how are you going to open up and share your 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 power base um, because very often we're included as long as we don't have power you know as long as we're coming in with a little cap in hand and grateful you know like um, Sakia said you know you know take you know take the advice and and, and buy sort of thing no but you know and I am I have to say I am getting more and more um, skeptical about white people who want to include 
BIPOC characters, actually, when they don't know anybody BIPOC. Like, why are you doing it anyway? If you don't know the people already, why are you doing it? If those people aren't in your circle, why are you doing it? You've got to ask yourself that question, man. You know, um, why are you taking on, why are you including that character? Because is it a kind of tokenism because you think that's the, um, you know, the, the, the thing of today? Or genuinely, do you want to tell the story of that character? Because is that character going to die in the first, you know, like after the inciting incident? Like, what, like how important is this character to the story? I'm asking these hard questions, which I would ask anybody I'm mentoring. Because I've seen time and time again, white people take our stories and it's just like, we've done that. We've done the diversity thing. Moving on. And, and because of how we're colonized, a white person is much more likely to get validation for doing that than a cutie bipoc person who tells stories that are cutie bipoc based. So I'm asking you genuinely, do you know any cutie bipoc people? If you don't, why are you including this character? I think that's an excellent question, <clears throat> especially because if, uh, John, I don't know you, but if, if uh, this diversity including BIPOC storytelling, BIPOC stories is something that you think is important and something that you want to engage in, then um, there is a truth to maybe this is not how you start. Maybe there is BIPOC, cutie BIPOC talent wherever you live that you can support. I'm sorry, I'm getting really red because the sun is going down. <laughs> Um, maybe there's cutie BIPOC people that are trying to get into the film industry that you can support, that need money, that need someone to, they need a runner, that need contacts. Maybe that's a way for you to start if you think this is important. And I would like to say that I think everything that Campbell just said is amazing and important because when we talk about diversity and inclusivity, especially when we're, talk, we're coming with uh, maybe spaces or privileges of power, we need to get uncomfortable. It's 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 welcome to the uncomfortable 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 zone, right? You you need to be a bit like, ooh, that ooh, I didn't think about that, or ooh, I, that hurts, or ooh, and maybe I feel a little bit stupid. That's okay. Um, I believe that amazing things come out of living in the discomfort. Um, so everything that Campbell said was amazing. I am very happy to know you. I want to thank everyone here for for being so honest and insightful. Um, and sharing your thoughts today. It's, I think it's gonna go a long way towards helping others who are navigating similar experiences. Um, and I also wanna direct people to a great resource, which is the GLAAD website, specifically in terms of trans representation, but for all LGBTQ community um, representation, they're, they're fantastic. So that's glaad.org. Um, someone called out, disclosure so I just want to give that a, another push as well if you haven't seen it yet on Netflix it's the gold standard in terms of discussing trans and non-binary media um, that's all I have thank you all so much this was amazing yes. oh my god it was so amazing thanks everybody thank you so everyone space with every one of you thank you thank you